Good. So um, welcome, everyone, to this um, session uh, of the Realising the European Open Science Cloud event, uh, which is dedicated to the place of persistent identifiers in the EOSC. Um, I'm Simon Lambert. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Freya project, which was um, one of the European projects. Uh, well, it's the, the, the project concerned with infrastructure for persistent identifiers and contributing to building the European Open Science Cloud. Um, we have a, a, a quite a, a nice and varied program, which I will show you now. Um, so it's it's approaching the the question from from two angles, really the the top down and the and the bottom up. So first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Brian Matthews, who's a colleague of mine at STFC, uh, on the EOSC uh, view of persistent identifiers through policy and architecture. Um, then we're going to have several talks about. Um, uh, applications and requirements for persistent identifiers uh, in, in different domains uh, and um, with different perspectives uh, on, on how they're used in reality and I suppose what the implications could be for the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, and finally, a period of, of discussion, uh, which I'll lead at the end. Um, so the way I'd, I'd like to do this is to allow the, uh, the presenters to, to give their talks and then we can have a, a short period uh, for just some uh, brief question and answer uh, after each talk just for a few minutes uh, and then a fuller discussion uh, at the end of the uh, of, of the session for 20 minutes if we're still on time. Um, so that's enough uh, talking from me. Uh, I think we should we should proceed with our, our first talk, which, as I said, is my colleague Brian Matthews uh, on the EOSC view of PID policy and architecture. So, Brian, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, just bear with me when I get the presentation up, which I think is this one. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, that's good. Great, wonderful. Okay, so I, I'm going to give a talk on, on, on two halves. Um, so firstly, the persistent identifier policy for the European Open Science Cloud work that's been going on over the last year, and then work that's happened sort of in parallel, but slightly more recently on uh, the PID architecture for the EOSC. And all this is, is happening within the context of the um, the working groups of the EOSC executive board, um, particularly the the um, architecture working group and the, and the FAIR working group. And these slides are a sort of a joint um, um, a joint venture. Um, so starting with the, the kind of the first half of the talk, um, uh, please identify policy for the for the EOSC. This, this is this part of the talk is, is been prepared by myself, but also contributions from Rachel and Anders. There are a number of the people who are also involved in, in the work. Um, in fact, these are the people involved in the work. So uh, the the um, PID policy has been developed jointly by by two working groups from the EOS Executive Board. Um, firstly, the Fair Working Group with these people here, Peter, um, Rachel, Anders, and Andre. And uh, from the Architecture Working Group, uh, there was a, uh, um, well, in the end, there was a slightly larger group of people. Um, it was originally four of us, but then Maggie and Mario joined. Um, uh, um, to contribute to the to the to the actual final uh, PID policy document, uh, and there are a, a larger number of people involved, uh, consulted who, who's involved in both both working groups who came to some of the meetings and, and, and gave input. Progress. Well, we had we started um, pretty well exactly a year ago, actually, just over a year ago now. Um, Iterative development since then, did our first draft in uh, this last December, released our first draft in December, went through a first consultation progress process, had our second draft in May, final and then um, final version in, in September um, as a community consultation. Then it was put out for consultation across member states and other stakeholders. And got our final version published at the your symposium a few weeks ago now, um, and that's now available and now available as a nice glossy um, 
European Commission uh, expert report. So that's now available there. Um, ironically enough, the DOI didn't work for quite a while, but now it does work. <laughs> so that is now available as a, uh, as, um, from, from the Europa site under its DOI. So what were we trying to do in this? What was the purposes of the policy? Well, this is mostly for, for senior decision makers uh, within potential um, EOSC service and infrastructure providers. And what we we're trying to do was define the set of expectations um, uh, and rules which will support the provision and use of persistent identifiers within a, a functioning environment of the EOS which supports fair research. Um, so as part of that, setting out the requirements of providers and what basic services they and what the basic services they should provide um, to try and uh, uh, and also to some extent uh, set the expectations of how users should behave with respect to PIDs so we can so the EOS can have a trusted and um, reliable and trustworthy uh, pers uh, persistent identifier infrastructure that that um, that lasts well, sort of indefinitely, certainly for a considerable period of time, with the guarantees of, of, of longevity that that entails. Um, and then the, uh, the this was very much looking at policy, though the 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 um, the rules of engagement, if you like, um, on, on person identifiers. What um, it was trying to be very very implementation. Uh, independent, not talking about trying to avoid talking about implementation completely, uh, and those the implementation guidance would be given in term from the recommendations of a different thread of work concentrated in the arch the architecture working group on a technical architecture, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, so the scope, um, so we were concerned with supporting the OSC research. Um, highlight the need that it's a, a global activity, PIDs are global infrastructures, they need to work globally. Um, it's no good being restricted to, to European, European projects, and needs to be available everywhere, uh, and, would, ought, and needs to have a very broad applicability with a wide, wide range of, of PID use, um, a, a focus on, on fair digital objects and what fair digital object means. Um, I had quite a discussion about what difference between fair digital objects and, and sort of a general uh, digital entity, or, 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 sorry, non-digital entity even, um, and it needed to deal with digital and, and non-digital entities as well. Um, the uh, policy is, is preceded by a set of general principles uh, that we are uh, working towards a sustainable, uh, trusted bit infrastructure, uh, suitable for a long-term sustainability to the EOSC. Um, hello, am I still broadcasting? No, we seem to have lost your screen share. Ah, yeah. okay. Uh, can you try again? I will try again. Now? Yeah, it's back yep. again. Okay, sorry, I've had a few network problems today, so I hope this is not, I hope this will, will hold up. Um, we want to, get to cover a, a very wide range of use cases uh, and not create barriers. We want to be very much enabling in this PID policy, very open to, to new technology, which I think I mentioned later down. Um, we want to, uh, of course, support the FAIR principles uh, and recognizing that PIDs are the central component of FAIR research. Um, but, uh, but be inclusive with a wide range of PID practices and suppliers and independent of technology. So we didn't want to be biased towards any particular um, uh, suppliers or way of providing PIDs. Um, uh, have that balance, um, but nevertheless try to identify some level of maturity. Uh, we do need some level of maturity and reliability and trustworthiness to be very suitable for for EOSC adoption um, without uh, excluding new uh, innovations and new services. Um, so uh, we spent a lot of work time in, in, the, in the document looking at coverage, what it really means to be a persistent identifier, that it's globally unique, that it's resolvent and that it's persistent and what persistence means in this context. Um, 
uh, and looking at applications, way in which PIDs are provided, which they're used and which they're supported, and looking at the different types of PIDs that, that, and the different ways that PID types are managed. Uh, there's good information about the roles and responsibility of PID services and PID providers. We tried to kind of distinguish between the various roles in, in the whole PID infrastructure. Um, not necessarily roles rather than sort of organizations or individuals you know, because a person an organization could take more than one role or roles could be split across different organ different different entities as well uh, but try to give a minimum level of service provision and some expectation of maturity and reliability and longevity including um uh making sure that there's a there's some taking into account of what happens if a PID provider ceases to exist and, and some way of that there's some guarantee that the PIDs will still be usable. Um, and there's wasn't, you know, and there was some mention at the end towards of, of governance and, and sustainability. So that's probably enough on the PID policy. Uh, moving on to the PID architecture. Now um, uh, uh, the PID architecture working group um, so the, the PID architecture for the EOSC uh, group was at, was led by Ulrich Schwadman uh, and also uh, with a lot of input from Raphael Ritz and I, and I would like to thank Raphael for for, for these slides. I've, I've borrowed his uh, borrowed all of these his slides here. Um, this was, as I said, done by a different working group. Um, uh, the part of the, the the architecture working group PID task force uh, led by Ulrich. Uh, and with the members, uh, the active members were, were these here, Martin, Maggie, myself, uh, much less involved in this than the policy. Uh, personally, um, uh, Raphael, Mario, Mark and, and Themis. Uh, we're now at the stage where we have a candidate working, working document, um, which is available here. Uh, we're still very open to comments on this. Uh, and as, a, as a public consultation, but would expect to, to have this wrapped up by the end of the year. Um, contents, well, it looks at, after doing some introductory work, it looks at the, uh, the components and activities in uh, PID architecture, looks at certification, uh, has some discussion of implementations in, in particular in comparison with the DNS, uh, some discussion of performance and scalability, uh, security and resilience, and finally, it looks at where the gaps are um, um, in the existing PID landscape and what the challenges for future uh, development, investigation development is be. And, and this, this gaps area is very much what, what we're doing at the moment in this consultation, try to assess the, the, the gaps. Uh, so it, it gives a quite a high level view of the architecture, gives descriptions like, like these, uh, um, these uh, sort of workflow diagrams, uh, or, or these um, yeah, these interaction diagrams, um, giving descriptions of the core processes involved in PIDs. So this is uh, the uh, a, a view on the sort of interactions between a, a, what a PID consumer and a, and the architecture, what they they want to do with PIDs and what they expect to get back. Again, like the PID policy, uh, trying to to specify the processes in a technology independent manner so again not not tied to any particular imp, um, implementation but trying to define the the the, the functions that, a, that such a implementation should provide uh, and they kind of went into some some detail in here in, in some cases uh, so this is a rather more complicated uh, uh, process description here looking at the PID reg uh, registry and registration resolution framework involved in such things as data type registries and profiles. Um, as I said, um, it, it has spent quite a lot, of, you know, most recent part has been trying to identify the, the gaps in provision, um, looking at things of things which, which, um, which we identified as gaps, particularly things like interoperability of uh, between different PID systems, we, do we need a generic global resolution system? Uh, what about a reverse lookup system? 
generic PID minting and, and, and scaling up technology. These are very, very much things of, of the interoperability of the, of the global PID infrastructure. And then things around uh, metadata, for example. So things about, about the use of type registries and kernel information types. Uh, and one particular thing that we have been asked very much in the, in the, in the uh, to look at in a EOS context is PIDs for services. This has been identified in uh, as part of the um, the the EOS core architecture. So so it's something that that um, that is um, would be useful to have. Um, so these are the priorities. So these sort of you know, this is slightly repetitive here, but this is um, uh, sort of sort of the priorities we're looking at at the moment. So at the moment we are doing a survey on um on these priorities and would expect um, that in the final version we will 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 we'll have some some knowledge of, of where we're going to prioritize these these gaps and make recommendations for what kind of work should follow up in the in the next phases of the of the eos development for, for doing some of these things uh, and that is also reflected um in the seria document as well um uh, where there's also some discussion about uh, some gaps and, and, prior, uh, and um, for future work. Um, yeah, actually is mentioned here, yes. Uh, so I would note that in the, the Surreal Open consultation we just had recently, um, that the, uh, the the identifiers, best for every frameworks were identified as some of the most important implementation challenges that remain for the EOSC. And when they set implementation priorities, uh, one of the uh, major priorities was uh, implementing PAID policy and develop, developing additional infrastructure. So I think we can expect to see uh, in the future um, governance arrangements for the EOSC the, uh, and the future plans for EOSC development, we're going to see uh, PID policy uh, taken forward and uh, and um, future actions on developing the PID infrastructure. So I think we're going to see, quite, hopefully going to see quite a lot come out of this. So I think that was my final slide. Yes. So thank you. I should say thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for listening. And, uh, Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, that was that was great, very uh, informative. Um, does anyone have any uh, quick questions now? Uh, as I said, we can have a more open discussion at the end, but if there are any quick questions to Brian, please feel free to ask them now. Um, Ricardo, perhaps you could explain how we're doing questions. Is it uh, through the chat or uh, Q&A or some other, other mechanism? Yeah. So I would suggest that people can put their questions in the chat and then we can, um, I mean, now I'm also happy if people want to unmute, but best is probably to put it in the chat and then we can have some more discussions in the discussion section. So uh, Brian, a, a quick question from, from me, in fact, because perhaps not everyone on the call will, will, will know. Um, what is a data type registry in this context? Um, so this is the data type registry. This is uh, as it's defined in by the RDA data type registry. So this is, um, oh, what is it? Good question. Um, it's looking at the, um, the, the, uh, <laughs> it's looking at the, well, data type registry in, in, a, in the, um, RDA sense is looking at the types of the data, so it's it's actually registering the, the types of the data which are used in the in the in the um, in the PID. Maybe I can answer this. Maybe yeah, that will be part of, of the next the next slides. Oh. Uh, about a little bit about uh, data type registries. Okay, fine, fine. In that, yes, yeah. Um, okay, I don't don't see any uh, any questions having been raised in the in the chat. So in that case, I think, Mark, I will hand over to you, uh, Mark van der Sanden of Surfsara on some missing PIDs, services, instruments, and data types. Ah, there we are, yes. Okay, Mark, you may share your screen. Yep, I will look where I can share my screen. This one. 
Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. That looks good. Okay, there's in the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark van der Zande, and I represent also EOSCAP, uh, EU DAT, and also my uh, uh, local organization, uh, SERV. And in this, uh, and in this uh, presentation, I will talk about uh, what I have called uh, missing PEDs. Uh, it is not always that the PEDs are missing, but if you look at uh, PED for data types, uh, we have some serves available. It is an output from the RDA, but I would say they are less, more unused at the moment because there are a lot of data types available, but the service itself is not yet really uh, loose at, uh, at large scale. Uh, another output from uh, the RDA, which is PEDs from instruments, uh, which is already uh, some information available, but that is a little bit more in development uh, uh, at community sites, but also not really in central service being provided for doing this. And I present a little bit on this. Uh, and something which is not yet available, but is identified as a gap. PEDs for services, and I will explain a little bit about how this is then related, for example, about the service registries, the service catalog, uh, which is being built up uh, with NEOS. But first start with the data type registries. Uh, I used a lot of slides from uh, Ulrich Schleisman because he has been working a long time already on data type registries and also on developing a service for, for having this. Uh, what is the purpose for uh, a data type registry is, is mainly focusing about uh, reusability and reusability of, of data and how data is being described and uh, data, including the metadata. Data is for frequently described in repositories via metadata, but uh, it is not always clear how the different uh, fields within the data or within the metadata should be interpreted. And you can provide a lot of information for human readable into consumption. But if you want to have something which is a uh, machine actionable, then uh, you need a little bit more because machines are less as humans, easy in interpreting uh, full type text in metadata. So for uh, to be able to have this, it is for the reusability, but also if you want to do data migrations from older formats to newer formats, they really need to know how the data is being described, how the metadata is being described. And there are many differentiations between, for example, for generic purposes, community purposes. So it is for the whole process to make fair in reality, then you also want to use uh, PEDs for data types. So really that you know what the data is meaning. Uh, as, as, as said, there are already many metadata descriptions that are available. There are metadata descriptions available for generic use in many different repositories. Uh, there are also, for example, uh, demands if you want to describe data for uh, assigning DOIs, then you also have to describe your, your data. But also within the communities, there are many, many metadata standards uh, uh, available. But if you want to interpret those metadata standards from which angle you want to look at this, you need to, you need to know really about what type of what data type, uh, what the key is and how this data type or the key should be interpreted. And that can differ from one community to another community or from one repository to another. So to having those standards and that you know, if you look at metadata and you want to read and understand uh, the metadata in itself, and data type registry will help because there you will define for your key, for your purpose, what your key is, is meaning about. If you look at many of those standards, it's also already providing a lot of information of, of how metadata is, is being described. And uh, for example, this, uh, this metadata is being provided via documents, or even if you want to have something, there are examples made within uh, a consumable data formats from uh, the technical point of view, but this type of information is not really uh, machine actionable if you want to run this automatically within, within workflows. How do you want to consume and interpret data? 
And I think that is one of the purposes where you want to look at from the data type uh, uh, perspective. So if you have in this, uh, this diagram, you see that there are users who want to run some processing, uh, but to be able to, to start up those processing, you need a little bit more about what type of information is then to be consumed. And therefore, I think the data type registry comes into play. So that before you want to start up any, any of the jobs you want to run, then you know what type of data, what type of executables you need to run, what type of functions you want to provide to really interpret uh, how the data is being constructed and how the metadata, for example, is being able to consume. And the data type registry can provide this type of capability. Um, this is, for example, uh, how data type is then being described within the service as which is provided by Epic. You describe a uh, data, you can provide a description. Each data type will get a position identifier so that you are also clearly know which unique registration this data type is being recorded. Uh, but also you can provide also, also next to a description how the values of this data type is being can be interpreted. And this, I think, makes it very strong to have a data type registry because you precisely describe how a data type should be interpreted. But you can also have hierarchies of, 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 of metadata. So, and that, as I think, is one of the things which you can build up within the data type registry. It's not only about one single data type, but you can build up hierarchies of metadata so that you can build up complete metadata templates of defined data types, including references to the metadata template. And I think that is also very useful, for example, if you translate this to uh, community specific metadata uh, schemas, metadata templates, including defined data types. Um, the Epic Consortium has uh, set up a service for, for doing this. You can already find within the information, uh, URL references where you can find information about uh, the uh, data type registry, but also the data type registry itself. At the moment, there are two uh, data type registries available, one for testing, so that if you want to describe your data and want to have the feeling how this will look like, or if you want to automate this process for registering data types, uh, you can use the test uh, uh, data type registry. And when everything is, is working, then you can go over to a production data type registry uh, for registering all the data types. But as said, uh, the, the service I think is very uh, valuable, but it should be used more in production so that it is really working within workflows, but also in how uh, services are being used in use of the data type registry. The next service is uh, PEDs for instruments. Um, this is also uh, output. There is an RDA working group, which have been working uh, uh, a few years on defining uh, a metadata template for uh, how to describe instruments. An instruments is very uh, uh, broadly described. Uh, it can be described, it is mainly focusing about uh, uh, non-digital uh, uh, objects, but in a digital representation of these of these objects. And you have many different uh, uh, instruments. It can be uh, instruments which, for example, is very much used in our, our environmental uh, use cases where there are a lot of sensors available, uh, very much very similar sensors, but they are located at many different places. But you can also have, for example, very big machines which is a central uh, instrument, but you want to have different collaboration recorded on this big machine. So there are many different use cases for registering instruments and that you clearly know what kind of uh, instrument or which setting of the instrument has been used with a certain kind of research. Uh, the working group has collected a large number of, of use cases, uh, which has been described and how put into a GitHub, and these are then the use cases of how to describe uh, the instruments. Uh, they produced a metadata template for describing those instrument instruments, uh, published a, a white paper, and there is also a site where multiple uh, uh, update stories are being described. But 
if you have an, an, a template for uh, describing uh, instruments, that does not automatically mean that you have a service where you can register those instruments. And this is where we have been looking at to see how can we build up a, a service where uh, instruments can be registered and where a PUD can be provided for referring to. Uh, there is collaboration between uh, EUDAT, DataSite and EPIC on to developing those uh, the session, session uh, um, uh, registry. And EPIC and DataSite has already been involved very much within the RDA working group and to see how can uh, the metadata which has been established within the working group, how does this match uh, within uh, the metadata standards they provide. For example, how does this template reflect to the, DU, uh, the data site uh, metadata, for example, for registering DOIs. And this assessment uh, looked at uh, there is a very large overlap between the metadata standard so that it is usable, but it is not 100% fully fitting. Was that was in the EPIC uh, template, it was much easier because if you look at the data type registry, you can register these data types. So you can build up your uh, metadata template according to what is specified. And for this, we have been looking further to see, okay, how can this be explored further so that you can also provide a registry where you uh, register the instruments itself. And for this, uh, we have been looking at uh, a service, which was uh, our technology, which we have been using within the UDOT, which is B2Share. And within B2Share, where we can easily set up repositories, we can also easily adapt the metadata schema. And this is what we have done for building up uh, the uh, data type of the PED uh, service for registering uh, instruments. And um, for, for this, we adapted the uh, metadata schema, and then you can easily register an instrument and you can provide uh, a landing page where this instrument is being described. And this is a screenshot of the uh, landing page where you can see the instrument has a name, it has a description, and most importantly, it has a PED, and which refers to this landing page. It provides all the metadata uh, which you have filled in for describing uh, uh, the instrument according to the instrument uh, metadata. But what we also provide is, for example, you can upload uh, additional uh, data to the instrument, for example, a user manual of pictures so that people also know what the instrument is about. Uh, also, the metadata can be versioned. So if there are changes, then uh, uh, you can upload a new metadata for the same instrument. Uh, but what we also can support, for example, is community exchanges, because the uh, metadata template for instrument is a minimal metadata template. There are optional fields, but also looking at the use cases, many of the communities have more extensive metadata on how to describe uh, instruments within their science domain, and that can also be uh, supported. Uh, what are the next steps? Uh, we are at the moment running a pilot. We have a pilot instance available. Um, at the moment, the, the, it is a pilot instance, so therefore we do not yet provide guarantees on the availability of the service, but also not on, on, on the data. Uh, but if it is successful, then we continue and to provide a more permanent service. Uh, further, also, we are working further with, with data site so that more instrument uh, uh, keys are being included within the data site uh, metadata schema so that we can further fully support uh, PD for instrument also within DOIs. And also, uh, because PEDs are assigned to instruments, they can also then automatically be integrated within the PED graph so that you can relate instruments to data, to organizations, even to funding of those uh, those type of instruments. Finally, uh, something about PEDs for services, which is not uh, uh, at the moment, we do not have a service for doing this, uh, but it has identified as a gap uh, also within the work within EOS, within the working groups, within the PED working groups. Um, and what is what are the use cases for PEDs for services? Um, one of the, the 
we have discussing uh, a few use cases and those are just three of them and uh, one of the things is that for example if you have a provider who provides a service has a service described in the zone uh, service catalog from the organization but it is requested that the services are being visited for example registered within the service catalog but also it can be registered in regional automatic service catalogs but how do you know which is the service and if these services are even related to each other uh, or it is the same service and one of the mechanisms for doing this is to assign process identifiers to a service or to a service description and if the PDs are then used across the different catalogs then you know that it will be the same service if the PD is uh, the same the same uh, PD in the different catalogs um, also for example for uh, uh, researchers who want to cite services so that it is clear that they have used this service uh, normally citing is done via position identifiers but because we do not have a PED for services, then citing is mostly done by just describing which service you have been using or that it is acknowledged within, uh, uh, within the paper. But I think it is also very handy for funding agencies that they know if, uh, if a service is being used and how they are being used or how frequently those services are being used. And that can also be done by uh, process identifiers if they are assigned are to services so that funding agencies can collect the uses of those PEDs via different means and that they know that the services which they provide, which they fund, are valuable for research and that they are acknowledged for, for having this. I have to describe this in, in, in a diagram where, for example, a resource is being provided by a resource provider and it's the resource provider is to onboard the resource in the resource catalog in the EOS portal resource catalog but the resource provider uh, is also working very much within uh, the uh, regional uh, and working with other uh, catalog owners for registering those services for example it can be registered in the EOS Nordic catalog uh, but also for example it can be registered in a thematic service uh, catalog for example provided by one of the cluster communities. But to know that these are all the same services, then it will be handy to have a process identifier with those services. But we are also working with regional automatic catalog providers that they want to register also all their services in the EOS portal. And for not having all those services being entered again, while they already have been entered into the catalog, it would be very much to see if the same services is already entered into, into the, the catalog and you can do this on basis of, for example, the position identifiers. But the other use case, what we also see is that because uh, many services are being provided in the EOS portal uh, uh, service catalog, also thematic catalog owners can already retrieve this type of information and register those services again in their own catalog. And to maintain all these relationships for all those service descriptions, the position identifier can be helpful because then you know that it is always the same service because they point to the, uh, the same uh, registration of information. So that was the PD will help. And then it will also help the users for referencing to the same service if they use always the same position identifier. Uh, this is an overview of, of a number of PD services, uh, which I think are, are will be uh, valuable for, for EOSC and will extend also the use cases which we can support within the EOSC for, for those purposes. If there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Um, uh, I can see that uh, a number of questions have been coming on the chat, but I think uh, they're, they're they, my impression is they're quite uh, uh, open questions that might be more suitable for the, the final discussion. Um, except, oh, there's a very last one from Dan Broder. How is the service PID linked to usage statistics? That's uh, Mark. Do you have a, any comment on that? Um, that that will be linked, but I think the usage statistics is is uh, still, for example. Should be integrated within uh, 
services and catalogs, how these are being used. And if the PEDs are always provided with the user statistic that it is concerning a certain kind of service, referenced by the PED, then this will uh, make it much more easier that uh, uh, the user statistics are, even if they are coming from different uh, sources or from different catalogs, uh, can be matched to the same service uh, via the, the same position identifier. But there's still a work in progress uh, where we, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to, for example, in the year's future project to further develop the concept of PED for services. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, so um, I suggest that we, we now move to, uh, to our ne next speaker, who's uh, Josef uh, Misutka of Charles University in the Czech Republic, who's going to be giving us a perspective from the social sciences and humanities uh, uh, on uh, uh, use of persistent identifiers. So Josef, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, both of those, yes. Perfect. So, hi, my name is uh, Jose Mishutka and I'm from Charles University and I'm responsible for the Lindat Clariach CZ technical infrastructure. My presentation will be slightly different to my previous speakers because I will describe the one PID system we use in, in more detail. Um, but before we get to that, uh, Let's, slide, let's briefly describe our project. So the project is in the Clary CZ, is a Czech branch of the Clarin project. Uh, we operate a linguistic data repository based on a heavily customized DSpace repository software. Uh, many other Clarin centers use this repository software uh, and it's available on GitHub. Every center that wants to be a Clarin B center has to pass the core trust seal certification and Clarin B center assessment. From the persistent uh, identifier point of view, the purpose of the certification and the assessment is to meet basic requirements and to have uh, the basic policies defined. So, uh, but in the social sciences and humanities open cloud, the members form a diverse group with different goals in respect to the PIDs. Uh, they are influenced by stakeholders, history, and the data they work with. For instance, some can focus on data publication and citation, others more on data management processing. Also, the required data granularity can vary. And uh, I would also like to mention there are quite a few PID systems available. And in this, uh, I would like to give you more details on our uh, repository. I'm sorry. Right, so, um, but let us get back to the project and uh, Linda Clariach CZ and the requirements we had on the PID uh, system. So we wanted to use PIDs, that's uh, clear, uh, but we also wanted to use it for both data citing and data processing management. There's to be human friendly, simply speaking, if you click on it, it should get you somewhere. Uh, it has to be also machine friendly, which means that the underlying data should be accessible via the uh, persistent identifier and if possible only by the persistent identifier without additional extra information uh, that cannot be uh, obtained uh, via the PID. It has to be sustainable with a clear business model. Uh, this is a more complex uh, requirement but simply speaking the cost should be predictable and we should have some authority over the minted PIDs themselves. Uh, then there are requirements required for the Clarin B Center and here the important point is that only two PID uh, systems meet the requirements, the handles and the DOIs. Uh, and I would also like to mention that the Clarin Eric is a consortium member of both the, the EPIC and the, and the data side. Uh, for those interested, I also added the link to document from 2008 uh, that compares different PID systems in a greater depth. So uh, in 2010, um, this is where we made the decision. Uh, it was 10 years ago. And we chose the handle system as our PID system. Uh, a few technical notes. So the costs for acquiring a prefix and running an in-house handle server uh, are one time 50 and a yearly 50 fee plus the hosting costs. costs but the, you can mint as many handles as required. 
Uh, if you do want to run it, if you do not want to run it uh, in-house, uh, Epic uh, is a handle prefix hosting provider and it operates the handle server for you. So these are the costs uh, and uh, yeah, the options. Um, but let get let's let's get back to the uh, like in general to the to the po to the to the PIDs itself. Uh, so choosing handles as the PID system means great flexibility, but with the flexibility comes also the responsibility. So the items listed uh, on this slide are important decisions or policies that have to be defined when using a PID system. Uh, some or all can be already hard coded with the PID system you use, but for handlers you can and actually you have to define it yourself. So I will explain the meaning of the policies uh, in a few slides. Um, I will describe the policies we chose for our repository afterwards. So first you have to decide whether you create the PIDs for your metadata and or for your data. Uh, or for both. Uh, then you uh, have the question whether you allow deleting a PID, which is very likely not a good idea. But for instance, uh, you know, you have to uh, handle a situation when some authors want to withdraw a submission from your repository. Uh, then what do you do? So that's also what you have to define. How do you handle new versions? You know, a minor or a major change to the metadata or to the data. Now, do you create a new PID for each version or do you have less strict policies? Which metadata are required and which are optional? How do you ensure machine readability? Because having a simple PID pointing to data really does not mean machine readability. I think it was already uh, nicely explained with the data type registries, uh, which can be used uh, in this context. And also, what do you need or what do you uh, do in order to help proper data citing? Um, these are more technical lists. This is a more technical list. And in some PID systems, you can have associated metadata directly with a PID. So do you use it? And uh, if so, for what? Uh, this could, for instance, help when the target URL is not available. You have PID metadata associated, so you can show to the user uh, this information. We are doing it in another service, not the repository itself, but uh, this is one use. Um, in Clarin, we have mutual agreements that when a center leaves Clarin, others will take its responsibility and that includes its data and PIDs. Uh, because we use the handle system and centers have their own prefixes, moving the whole prefix to a new owner is very simple. This may or may not be true for other PID systems. So this is also what you have to take into account. And then there are even more technical ones, like are you going to use HTTP versus HTTPS uh, when you have an, a URLifying uh, PIDs, naming conventions, and so forth. So the details are on these two links uh, for our repository. So how does it look uh, in our repository now? Uh, in uh, the Linded Clary CZ. So first of all, uh, we assign PIDs to metadata records only. Uh, why? Because the underlying archive data format can change in long-term preservation systems. You know, just imagine from tar to 7-zip-zip zip or, or similar. But, uh, but also our linguistic data sets have different plain text formats. So at the moment, because it's not you know, uh, that widely used in production, the DTR is an answer to this, but we are not using it at the moment. Uh, if you use a PID, our PID in a browser, uh, you will get to a landing page. If you ask for specific content, you can get uh, the metadata in the requested schema and format. Uh, this is for machine readability. And uh, also our PID itself has minimal metadata associated. I will show you what I mean by that. So if you go to this uh, PID mentioned in the title, you will really go to our repository and end up on the landing page. So this is one of the policies we have. If you uh, ask for specific uh, content type, 
then you will get an XML. Inside that, you will get uh, metadata in the CMDI format. Uh, even though it's really interesting, it's out of the scope uh, of this presentation. But here, one of the required things is the uh, resource list where you also have uh, links to files, to bitstreams, including their checksum, including their MIME type, for instance. And uh, this is what we store with the PIDs themselves. So where was it, when was it, and to whom you should email if you have a problem. So even if the target URL is down, you still have this information available. Now, uh, further uh, in the policies uh, is the uh, citation policy, which for us is very important. And for every item in our repository, we show a box with citing information on the landing page. We call it a ref box. Uh, can be also used uh, on external websites, for instance, uh, on the project website. It tells the user that this is how the data should be cited. Uh, the citation text can be copied uh, as a plain text or BIPTEC format, and the citation itself contains the PID, which is uh, the most important thing. We uh, have the experience that uh, users were incorrectly citing data, so we really made it as the first thing they see, and uh, based on our experience, it has helped. Not 100%. But it has helped. Uh, then the we do not delete PIDs. Nobody really should. Uh, but it has happened, as I already mentioned, that uh, a new center joined Clarin and they wanted to move uh, some of their data sets there. So we allow that, but we still keep the data in its uh, exact version as was submitted to our repository because of reproducibility. We show a notification to the user informing them that uh, this happened, this is the new PID, they can go there. Or they can ask the version we have. Uh, then uh, we allow for reasonable changes to metadata, typos, or you know, changes of, uh, of institutions and really minor changes without a, without meeting a new PID. But other changes or newer versions result in a new PID. So on the image, uh, you know, we have, for instance, one uh, resource that has, you know, 10 or more, um, 10 or more versions. And also a good thing is that if the users create a new version, then all of the metadata is copied. They have to only change what really changed. Uh, and uh, on the last slide, I would like to you know, mention also the DOIs and uh, uh, how is it in respect to our repository. Um, so firstly, do not forget that DOI is a handle. Uh, but uh, DOI already covers a lot of the policies and infrastructure for you. Um, to summarize, uh, Clarin accepts both DOIs and handles as PID system. Uh, Clarin Eric is a data side mem member, and both the handle system and the DOIs have their strengths. Um, flexibility with handles comes at the cost of creating and enforcing the policies, and that is not a minor task. Uh, DOS have most of these policies preset, and they have running a scaling infrastructure. Also, additional interesting services available. And uh, we try to actively collaborate also on the PID, uh, uh, PID working groups, uh, and we follow the outcomes. And uh, if there is something interesting, which uh, we already uh, heard that there is, then uh, we will very likely adopt it also in the future versions of Clarin B center uh, assessment uh, requirements. So uh, thank you. And th thank you very much, Joseph, for a very uh, interesting talk on, on the Clarin requirements and, and practices. Um, I noticed that there's right at the end of the chat, there's one rather specific question that has 
arrived uh, directed to you, I think, about the um, location of data sets if they move from one Clarin site to another. The PID should still say that stay the same, presumably. Uh, exactly, and uh, because you owe the prefix, then uh, you can just uh, give it to another center, and all the authorization, you know, goes to the new center. So you have completely uh, control of the whole prefix. Uh, so uh, yes, that's true. The PID stay the same. That's really important, and that's exactly uh, what handle allow us to do. Okay. Thank you, Josef. Um, I think uh, uh, we, we should move on uh, immediately now to the to the final talk, which will be given by uh, Claudia Alain Amaro and uh, Marcus Povey. Uh, I should say that uh, Claudia has been one of the uh, our valued ambassadors in the Freya project, uh, and I'm very grateful for the work that she and the other ambassadors have done in publicising uh, the work of Freya. Um, uh, so over to you, Claudia and Marcus. Uh, hi, good morning to all. Uh, I am, we are going to do a bit of a double act. I'm going to tell you uh, who we are and why are we interested in, in PIDs. And then Marcus is going to, to tell you a bit how we are tackling the, the issue. And if we go to the next slide. Oh, it's being slow. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Then um, we face a, a big complexity in Instrakeric. Instrakeric is the single point of access to technology and expertise for structural biology research. And we face a lot of uh, um, complexity in many aspects. In, from our users, we uh, open our infrastructure to the whole world. Anybody in the world can apply and use our infrastructure if it's is seen as scientifically valid. We provide funding for the use of that infrastructure for the scientists from our member countries. And we have 15 members at the moment, which are 14 countries plus the EMBL, who pay an annual subscription, which allow the scientists to access this infrastructure uh, virtually free of cost. This is, then that's the, the complexity from the user base. We also have a complexity from our services. We have uh, services in all this, in instruct centers in eight instruct countries. Those are the red dots in the map. And this is an, then a distributed research infrastructure which comes with an elevated degree of complexity. And if we go to the next slide, Another thing to take into account when you think of how are you going to manage the complexity of Instruct is our catalog. Our catalog includes 75 different services from sample preparation to biomolecular and 3D structural analysis. This extensive service catalog encourages a multidisciplinary approach to a structural biology research. And you have to take into account that they are not only all these services, but some of these services are offered in different countries. Then if we go to the next one. Instruct Eric is an ESFRI landmark uh, project. It's also an Eric. In this uh, frame of mind, we are working together with other life science research infrastructures in the project EOS Life. And we are also being collaborating with Freya, with Open Air, with uh, many other projects to make sure that we don't duplicate efforts and we tackle all the things we have in common in a common way. From our side, we have developed our own proposal managed, management system called ARIA. And this proposal management system has already tackled some of the PIDs we need to follow our research from submission to publication. But other areas, like for example, the identification of the user or the, or the 
connection with publications, we are looking outside to, to see how we can follow the, the research where the research goes. And as I said, in this important uh, matter, we are working in collaboration with EOS Life, with other life science research infrastructure, and also with uh, other ethics in the ethic forum. Now I'm going to pass to Marcus, who will tell you how ARIA has been working towards building this PID graph for uh, structural biology research. Uh, thanks, Claudia. Um, okay, so um, as we mentioned, we're, we're sort of mo mainly in the, uh, well, we, we focus on structural biology. So this, I'm going to be talking using structural biology as an example, but we can kind of out take this as an abstract. So we've got four pillars to our mission, as it were. Um, we provide access, so access to infrastructures. Uh, we provide um, tools to help facilities manage their equipment. Uh, community, um, which we are, which we've mentioned, so working with different projects um, within the uh, structural biology community and, and beyond, and data. Um, and it's this last one that, I, that concerns us today. And yes, we use uh, an in-house built um, piece of software called ARIA to deliver this. Now that's, that informs some of the discussion here, but uh, again, we can kind of abstract it a bit. So, uh, structural biologists, uh, as you may or may not be surprised here, use microscopes. Um, however, they're not um, the simple ones you might uh, have used at school. This is a Titan Cryos, uh, which is a very expensive piece of kit. Um, and it, well, this particular one has uh, 12 sample grids um, and it outputs about three terabytes of high definition video per day. And we've got, we have multiples of these. So um, this is uh, an example of a typical workflow that you might expect for this machine. So someone submits a, a research proposal for funding through us. Um, and then they go on a visit, they prepare their samples, the samples are loaded into the microscope. We then do um, processing on that data. So that's passing it through various complicated bits of software. And then hopefully you get a, a structure identified and then eventually a, a research output of some sort, whether that's a, a, um, a new structure identified or a, um, a, a article in the journal. But in order to do this, um, and in, as, as concerns us today, in order to be able to try and reproduce this as you want to do in science, uh, there's quite a lot of this that you'll want to keep track of. So uh, we want to track um, all of this sort of stuff, maybe. Um, so the, the samples used, how they're prepared, the, the frames, the important frames of video, um, identifying the structures. Um, some of this slide, if you if you've, uh, were at the EOSC events last year, um, I discussed a little bit of this um, in the conversation around workflow optimization, but it's, it's kind of a similar problem. Um, so all of this, so we've got quite a lot of data that we need to keep track of, um, and we need to multiply that all by the number of facilities uh, that we're, we're involved with. So we, it's not just one, it's not just one uh, facility that we, we provide access to, it's multiple. Um, there is more that we want to track. So we want to keep track of the data processing workflow, so the software, and software versions and software libraries that are being used to pro do the processing. Um, we need to identify the samples and sample metadata, how the, how the sample was prepared is quite often very important. Um, and we need to keep track of the configuration of the machine, how the machine was set up in the, the instance it was used. Um, software, software versions as said. Um, potentially the researchers involved 
And for us, um, things like funding applications, uh, that's also very important to keep track of. Uh, we Structural biologists also use synchrotrons. This one is uh, the in of diamond, which is one of our diamond light source, which is one of our centers. And we have similar large data volumes um, and complexities involved. So we we need the similar um, output in terms of uh, terabytes of data. Uh, software configuration is also important. Um, this is a typical workflow, which is kind of similar. We get a proposal for access, the sample is prepared, it's blasted with uh, x-rays, and then we do some analysis and then hopefully get an output. Um, so, as I said, there is a lot we want to keep track of. Um, and this uh, keeps give, gives us uh, some quite interesting problems to solve. Uh, the data sets are quite often too large to practically move about. Um, machine configurations, they quite often stay um, necessarily sort of on the machine or near the machine anyway. Um, Software gets modified, libraries change, um, IT gets upgraded, that sort of thing. So how can we make this reproducible? And we're kind of looking at uh, seeing if we can do use the PID graph to, to help keep, keep all of this together, all these little bits together. Um, so this is what the idea we've kind of been playing with. Um, first off, uh, we would want to build, so when, when a researcher carries out an experiment and this is, this is going, there are going to be potentially multiples of these, uh, we want to kind of build an experimental session. And the idea here is at the beginning, we, uh, we mint a PID to identify the session. Um, in ARIA, we already kind of have this concept. We have this concept of a visit um and a and it would be a, for us relatively easy to keep track of it as part of that um at this point it'd be a good idea to reference the the uh researcher and the research team um i've only got one little guy here but there's going to be potentially many um we do keep we do use orchids in terms of um, or can do, we're making more extensive use of ORCIDs and we might want to identify the institution at this point as well. Um, so then what we'd want to do is you'd want to min mint a PID for each sort of asset. Um, so that would be the workflows, the samples, the machine and machine co configuration. Um, this eagle-eyed uh, people who saw my last talk on this would be uh, familiar that this is essentially the idea of a, a workflow that we would, might want to then later do further analysis to optimize, but that's, that's out of scope here. And relevant is of course, highly application specific. Um, here is an example of some of them, um, but different, uh, people who are in different fields would be identifying different things. Um, and the main, main idea is that we all sort of link back to this one uh, token that keeps track of this. So then in, because there are multiples, multiple visits to multiple different centers ar around um, the Euro Europe, uh, potentially the world, uh, we kind of want to tied all of these together in something that is is useful um, so this is the idea of this concept of a research bundle so once uh we've we've done as it were um once we've got an output uh we we want to tie all this together um by creating this this identifier and then linking back to the various other things that we can keep track of so how you might use this um, is you would sort of, so you'd interrogate your published output to find your research bundle um, using, using PID graph. Um, 
and then drill down into these um, session identifiers. And then, um, so yeah, so then, then you would want to drill down further. Once you've, you, you, once you've got your various um, experimental sessions, you'd unpack them. And then you'd have, you'd have these, these assets available to you, um, which is yeah, a similar use story. So obviously you're gonna need some tools to make this useful. Um, we, I was looking at this very much from an ARIA perspective and ARIA does allow us to do, because uh, we, we kind of cover the, a, a large part of um, this, this, this process. Uh, so we, we, take, um, we take an access proposal and then, we, then through that we, we, we get grant access to various facilities and each of these facilities have visits that, that, and in the visits can be unpacked into different set into uh, sessions and checkpoints. So we've got we've got a lot of stuff we can hang this off. But essentially, the tools would look something like, like this. We have three main tasks. So we want a a tool for minting PIDs, make it easy to mint PIDs for the assets, um, linking those together, and then a way of interrogating that without. Uh, typing in GraphQL queries, as fun as that is, um, in a, a, to be able to present this to someone in a, in a useful way. Um, and yes, this will be wrapped up into uh, one or more services. Um, and it would, so, so to start off with, we have this concept of a experiment session manager. I, it's a terrible name, but it's what I use. Um, which handles this part. So this would be primarily be used by um, sort of infrastructures when when someone visits. Um, so this would handle the 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 uh, minting of the initial PID and then linking. Um, and then as we go through, we can we can assign we can add add these to that. Um, so how this tool, how imagine this tool to work would be something along the lines of this. Excuse so, me, Mark, Marcus, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but um, I'm told that we do have to finish the session very promptly at, um, at three o'clock. So could I ask you to, uh, to finish up um, uh, quite quickly if you can? Oh, cool. Sorry. Sorry. I lost Just to allow a bit, a bit of time for some, some open discussion at the end. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the, we, we really can't go on, I'm afraid, beyond three o'clock. No problem. OK, mm -hmm. well, I'll fly through these, these last slides They're very, mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, this is basically how, how you use, use it. They, uh, a researcher would turn up, they'd scan a QR code, um, and this would trigger this, the, the beginning of the, this session. Um, and then the facility can then add add more as they go. Um, then we have this this claiming tool, which is the idea of creating this link. Um, and th this would allow allow either the the access provider in the first instance, which is how I man managed it because that's where the KPIs fall, um, or the researcher doesn't matter. Um, to create this this one time link between these two, um, and yeah, so fly through this, um, and then uh, the viewer, which is just very simply um, the way of handling the drill downs into these various bits and do the unpacking, and present that in a kind of UX nice way um, of of uh, and, and a usable way. Anyway. Um, next steps for us would be, uh, we are committed to this from a data point of view, um, in terms of at least putting something together for this. Um, and a many, much of this has been requested by our user group, so it's something we're actively working on. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. I'm, I'm sorry to hurry you at the end. That was no worries. No worries. <laughs> great, great. 
Sure fascinating, to fascinating talk, and thank you to, to Claudia as well. Um, okay, we have uh, exactly fifteen minutes for some some questions or, or discussion. Um, I, I, I can see that there were there were quite a number of questions uh, arising in the chat, uh, some of which were 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 answered or at least uh, uh, had had some some response. Um, but I, I suggest may, maybe uh, in the interests of, of, of efficiency and, and so on, maybe we could simply switch to voice at this point. So if anyone would like to to raise a question or or an issue, then. I think just just unmute yourself and um, and and speak and 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 let's let's try that. I've got a question, uh, Simon. Dan yes, Rube. go ahead, please, Dan. Go ahead. Um, yes. Yeah. So th there are people here that are involved in the uh, EOSC uh, PID policy uh, uh, finding, um, and. I would like to know, is there any any sign at all that policies will be formulated that will, how do you say, uh, be problematic to um, uh, practices that are currently in place? Because they might be, uh, let's say, in, in, not interoperable with uh, desired desired strategies or anything maybe, like that maybe i should pick that up i mean yeah please matthew um not that we're aware of i mean we we do try did you know when we're doing the, the pid policy we did try to be as implementation um agnostic as we could be um and technology agnostic um, and and try to have as wide a range of, of use cases. I mean, um, for example, uh, we talk about some kind of authority, an authority that kind of controls how how PIDs are formed, um, which, and then people say, well, what about things like intrinsic PIDs, um, which you get from, say, the software, PID work that, that's going on in RDA, um, but you can still couch that even those sort of things in in those sort of terms that there isn't there is a an authoritative way of producing those PIDs. So so um, and there are other things like using no central authority, like using blockchain to manage a PID system. That also works. So, so there's some of these new and innovative ways of doing it. We see are covered in the policy. Um, the th the key point to me is is about trustworthiness, mm -hmm. and if you can produce a sensible PID system that's trustworthy, i.e., it has some of the fundamental principles of 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 persistence of in of the invariance you need of the um, resolvability that you need, then. It all should be able to work within the policy, as far as we see it. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, partly. Part, at least, <laughs> part, <laughs> at least oh, we can't anticipate everything that might come up. But that's yeah, yeah, it's difficult to think of everything that can come out of uh, the reports. Yeah, uh, but indeed trustworthiness, and uh, you mentioned resolvability. I know, for instance, that some systems that are still in use. Your NNBN, for instance, is uh, it's still used, EP clearing centers. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not really a standard resolve for code. Yeah, I, I, yeah, okay. I mean, we, you know, I don't want to recapitulate some of the arguments we had mm -hmm. um, around things like resolvability. You know, so there are systems that aren't necessarily resolvable. But I mean, the, the feeling was that if you have if you don't have the potential for machine actionability, um, then resolvability is is desirable at least. Um, I agree there are there are systems that that might not always be resolvable. Oh yeah, I think you have a question. Um, uh, hi, I wanted to to ask. I was very interested to hear about the PID for services, which which is something that has come up. Uh, many times as a need to to be able to not only to follow up what happened in a PDF graph, but also for researchers to be able to find 
the different uh, services. And we've been in discussion with countries for, for quite a long time now, how, to, how are they setting up this catalog of infrastructures? And I was wondering if there had been any conversation of applying this PID idea of services to the cataloging of services together with this project, Catrice. Uh, I will try to, to answer this. Um, the, we, uh, we do not directly work with, with Catrice, but uh, there are many uh, partners which work in Catrice, which also work uh, within the EOS Canons. A project and uh, with with them, uh, we work on the EOSC uh, service catalog, uh, and in this context, we are very much uh, discussing also the PD for services. So there are many uh, uh, colleagues from from Catris are part of this this discussion, and um, I I said I've shown in the in the diagram. It is that we are looking to see how can you use PDs across many different catalogs. Um, and that is not only the uh, EOS service catalog, but uh, it can be regional thematic, but also the infrastructure catalogs. And uh, the important aspect is that you can relate those different uh, descriptions which are registered in different catalogs to each other that you know that, uh, that they are uh, uh, the same or at least related. Uh, and that will be discussed uh, further when we uh, further develop this concept. And that will be in the context of the future uh, project. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions or observations? Please simply unmute yourself and, and speak if you'd like to. I mean, I, I have a, a general observation from, from the, the talks that we've, we've had. It's about the, the role of, of persistent identifiers. Um, I mean, in, in some cases, it's, it's persistent identifiers contributing to the, uh, to the, the process of, of research itself, um, to, uh, facilitating the way that things are done through clear identification of, of elements of the research process. And then there's the, the classic use of um, long-term uh, preservation of the, of the outputs of research so that you have you, you, you can always recover um, the, the, the artifacts of research you have reproducibility uh, and thirdly there's the use of persistent identifiers in the infrastructure itself of which uh, PIDs for services EOSC services in particular is, is uh, a classic example um, I find it interesting that the, the persistent identifiers have these three rather distinct roles and, and correspondingly distinct requirements, um, but being supported by essentially the same same infrastructure. Um, just a, just an observation, really, not really a question. But I, I fully agree uh, to this, that th th there are many different use cases. And uh, a PD support a lot of those those use cases to, to make Indeed, yes. uh, 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 different entities uh, referable so that you can use this and that you know that they are used, that you point to uh, uh, the, the entity you mean. Because even if the entities are very similar described, uh, does not mean that they are uh, are the same, or even they have different names. Uh, they uh, even can be the same, but people have named them differently. Uh, and process identifiers can be a, a useful uh, mechanism to identify uh, precisely the information which you uh, want to point to. Maybe I can ask a question related to this because, I mean, you mentioned these different roles, Simon, and I, this has come up in many times, especially in regarding, let's say, referring to data set and referring to certain, I mean, for the purposes of, of, of uh, credit giving, which is very common. Mm -hmm. And then also the other one, which is to for the uh, reproducing exactly the same results. And this is not always the same thing because not all, you cannot always 
follow the versioning, especially for very dynamic data sets very easily. And this is probably true for services and software as well. So there is a little bit of, I, I had some difficulty sometimes to figure out how to make this, this happen that way that we can fulfill all these different requirements at the same time. And I think we should also think what is the priority in, in these PID systems. Do we want to produce exactly the version what is needed, what was used before, or do we more like to just in general refer to some, some artifact of, of the scientific pro, um, process? Uh, just, uh, yeah, just that was comment. not the question, of course. Okay. <laughs> no, but just uh, just a comment on this, and I think that that strongly depends on on, on the use case which you are talking about. Uh, if it just uh, uh, is, is referring to be acknowledged, uh, then uh, maybe it is not that strong that uh, it is always the latest version or the the right version of the software which you have. But maybe the landing page is sufficient, but they know. Which type of software or, or or artifact you 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 have been using, but if you want to really reproduce uh, uh, the the same uh, uh, the same output on basis of the same workflow they uh, the, the researchers have been using, then it becomes more precise, and then you have to go to the details and then uh, persistent identifiers persistent identifiers uh, will be a useful mechanism because. With all the listing of the possession identifiers, uh, you can uh, uh, know which entities are really used within the whole workflow of the process of, of generating the, the output. Uh, it only what what it means could also be that maybe if you use uh, possession identifiers for software, that the software which you are pointing at is not always executable uh, on the new platforms where it has been used to produce the, the, the data and you need newer versions. But that is one of the things uh, you have to resolve at the time where you need uh, to produce it again. But at least you know what has been used. Yes, uh, so the last uh, couple of minutes, does anyone else want to ask a question or make an observation? I, I think just for the last minute regarding this, the same issue still, I think especially in the case of services, we need then to th figure out how to deal with the new versions that way that we can still ref or somehow package them that way or keeping the metadata, the provenance somehow there that, that we can really figure out that they refer to the same service, even though they have different PIDs but different versions of the same service. And you might not be able to ever get back to the other version of service. So that's also an interesting aspect, especially in the service PIDs. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I noted also one of the, within the chats, partly you can uh, uh, solve this to, to have a landing page of, of, of the service where you always describe the latest version, but you maintain the older versions and each of the older versions uh, have its own PED so that you know always can relate to each other. Uh, and yeah, certainly on the services, uh, there will be many changes within services and how to keep track of this. That is also, I think, a little bit of the discipline of the people who are working on those services to, to, to uh, track this information within, within the systems where they have so that you uh, do proper versioning of this information. Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think, um, unfortunately, I, I'm going to have to bring the session to an end now, but uh, I'd like to thank our speakers once more for some really nice and varied uh, presentations. Um, and thank uh, all the participants as well uh, for your uh, contributions. Um, okay. so. Uh, that's it for now. I'm going to stop recording and then end the session.